Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Future of Retail Customer Engagement 2021 from the Retail Bulletin. Uh, if you've just joined us, you are very welcome. If you've joined us for all of the sessions so far today, this is actually our third session, then well done. Remember, stick with us for all five and you get a badge at the end. Um, I'm Darren. Um, I will be the moderator for the session today. Um, what do I do with my day job? I am the chairman of a men's skincare brand called Scrubbed and also Williams Harling Consulting. Uh, currently working with uh, an amazing business in the world of chocolate and orthodontics. How's that for a mix? Um, so for my sins as well, I host some of these things. Retail Bulletin asked me back to do them again. So thank you for hiring me and I'll do my best to do a great job at moderating for you today. Most importantly is keeping our audience interested, and I have just the solution to do that with an amazing panel, actually. So um, I'm gonna get them to introduce themselves um, right now. If I may start with you, Sarah. Good afternoon, welcome to the panel. Tell us about you. Hi, so I'm Sarah. I head up the marketing and e-commerce team at Astrid and Mew. We're a jewelry brand, if you've not heard of us. Um, I've worked for the brand for over eight years and built up the marketing department from scratch. So I'm responsible for all of the uh, marketing budgets, long-term strategies, and just making sure that the brand is um, known worldwide across all retail and e-commerce. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here. I'm actually on maternity leave, so this is a nice break from changing nappies and being uh, covered in baby sick. <laughs> well, thank you <laughs> so for taking time me. out of your leave to, to join us today. And yeah, beautiful brand that you represent as well. So thank you for joining thank us. You. Um, you are very welcome. Richard, tell us about you, sir. You, 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 uh, you come from an industry that's had an incredibly challenging 18 months. Let's hear from you. Has head or still has? Uh, yes, well... Um, in, in the middle of, shall we say, hopefully right in the middle the other side. Thanks, Darren. Good afternoon, Richard. I look after all the marketing for Malaysia Airlines here in UK and Europe. So that's everything under the marketing umbrella from B2B, uh, B2C, uh, e-commerce and digital and even communications for the region. Thank you. Yeah. And I've been with the airline for four years now. Four years. Okay. And uh, the, the second half of which must have been the most challenging so far. Uh, all of the above have been challenging. Yeah. Uh, well, I look forward to hearing more. I think we've ever had anyone on the, on the retail bulletin from the airline industry before. I think it's, that could be a first for us. So you're very welcome. Uh, Mark, over to you. Actually, Mark, uh, Mark and Jocelyn, who, who we'll hear from after Mark, um, they represent our sponsors today. It mentioned me as well. So a big thank you for the sponsorship for the event as well. Mark, tell us about you. Uh, hi, Darren. I'm Mark Schwakey. I'm the marketing director at Mention Me. Um, I was long ago a journalist. I was, uh, I'm a former editor of Marketing Week magazine. Um, I took a little stint in agency world, then went into tech about six or seven years ago and held marketing and communications positions for a number of SaaS companies across the world and then uh, have landed here in mid-pandemic and I'm looking after everything marketing, communications, PR um, and awareness. So you started the business just a few months ago, right? February, yeah, yeah. So how many of your colleagues have you met in real real time on 3D, as I call it? I've met all the best ones. Um, <laughs> I reckon, I reckon, I've, I reckon, no, I reckon I've met about 20%, but it's strange how familiar you get with people by meeting with them every day on screen. I thought that might be a, a challenge, but it's been absolutely brilliant. It's been really yeah. good. I'm in the and office today, and there's a bunch of us here. Good stuff. Uh, Justin, I hope he included you in that 20%, yeah? Uh, I have met him, so hopefully I'm in, <laughs> I'm in that. Move, move. That's, that's, that's avoided an Justin, awkward moment. Josh, you're in the top 3% for sure. Oh, oh this is getting even better. You know people are going to start asking you, Mark, about yeah. what, yeah, where they fall in the grid. I'm making a list. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Jocelyn, let's hear from you, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Jocelyn. I'm head of <laughs> partnerships at Mention Me, uh, and I work on both our technology and agency partners um, and have been working with retailers for the past 12 years on driving growth through their digital marketing and getting the most out of their MarTech stack. Well, you're very welcome and congratulations for making Mark's top 3%. That is an Thank impressive. You very much. It's a big achievement. Sorry, can I just say here and now, if anyone's watching from Mention Me and I haven't met you, this was all just fluff, honestly. <laughs> on we go. Now he's backtracking. You know? yeah. So 
No, good fun. Thank, and again, thank you both uh, for mentioning me sponsorship today as well. So the sessions about customer loyalty and how to improve retention with personalization and digital experiences. I think um, big subject and this panel is going to have a lot to talk about, but we do want you to contribute as well as an audience. You're probably um, wondering something you might want to ask one of the particular people or brands, get it on the Q&A. Depending on what device you're on, you will find a Q&A button somewhere, use it. And my job as the moderator is to promise you, if you ask a question, we shall get it answered for you. Um, so as I say, it can be a generic panel question, or you might want to ask one of the guys here specifically. Um, we're going to kick off um, and have a really interesting session and see where this uh, session takes us. So I'm going to start, Sarah, with you, if I may. Um, yeah. Thinking about this whole customer loyalty piece, you're a, you're a brand that has commanded customer loyalty over the years. How do you win that customer loyalty through feedback and, and action it accordingly? Yeah, definitely. So this is so important for us. And one of the main things that we've done as a brand, and I think is so important for any other brand out there, is to build a real cult community and following behind your brand. Um, and this is something that we've worked really hard on over the last couple of years. So making sure that we um, are very present on all social channels, being very conversational. Um, and it's so important to do this seamlessly across all channels. We have um, obviously e-commerce platform and retail. And even given the current climate, retail is still so important for us. Um, so opening up that community that everyone really wants to be a part of making sure that you're very transparent and honest and really clear with your brand messaging and values um i think that is so important then once you've got that people feel really comfortable to give you feedback and open up that conversation with you so we continuously ask our customers through uh, surveys, polls, um, questionnaires, or just speaking directly with customers. What do they want to talk about? What do they know? What are their issues? What are they not so keen on? And then what we make sure that we do is everything that we get from customers, we then action it, but we're very transparent with it. So we'll let people know from start to finish what we've been asking for and, and how we've actioned it. Um, I think showing that everyone's feedback is really important to you and that you will actually do what they're asked, obviously within reason, you're always gonna get lots of different feedback and, and things, but this, really strengthen, strengthen the brand. And then it means that people really buy into that community and then buying this, into the lifestyle of the brand. We're not just a jewelry brand, we are a lifestyle brand. And yeah, this is so important for us. We found, I mean, for example, with lockdown, obviously our shops shut very quickly. Everything had to change. We, we do, um, a lot of services in our stores and that was one revenue driver that we couldn't take online so we asked our customers what they wanted to talk about what they wanted to know how they were just feeling in general and this really gained their trust because they could see that we were incorporating that into our marketing strategy we literally just ripped everything up and changed direction within a week or a few days um, and then yeah it kind of really got their trust um, so I think it's so important with customer loyalty that you really um, you're transparent and honest really build on that emotional connection with the customers make sure that you open that conversation out so continuously being conversational across all platforms um, and then obviously yeah most important build that cult community so people feel like they're part of it and I'm really comfortable giving you feedback um yeah you do a brilliant job of that on social media do you is that all done in-house or do you have some agency support with that as well uh no all in-house yeah so we have um quite a small team of of marketing professionals which has actually grown quite quickly over that down um, and I think because we do it all in-house it means that we are really reactive we can respond straight away 
we we are directly speaking to our customers through social or customer services and we can action it there and then um, and I think that has been the core for our company and our brand and getting that loyalty from customers um, I mean for example yeah Black Lives Matter happened we were able to really put a strong stance off the back of it action things very quickly but also show customers what we were doing and be completely honest yeah we weren't doing everything right but we we do want change and we've we've stuck to our word and a year later people can see exactly what we've done and we we did what we said we were going to do so I think that honesty is so important um with with talking to customers and and getting that feedback Uh, thanks Sarah that's really insightful thank you and I'll come back to you again shortly as well uh Richard hello sir um As I said, I think you're our first airline industry panellist we've ever had at the TRB, so you're very welcome, notwithstanding all of the challenges that your industry has faced um, over the course of the pandemic. um, Personalised experiences in in the airline industry, I mean, they have a lasting impact on customer loyalty, I would imagine. Um, And have you had to try and evolve that because of the pandemic, or has, has it been kind of business as usual on that subject? Help me understand. No, it's a continuing evolving product and program, of course. Uh, As everybody well knows, the loyalty programs within airlines are some of the more comprehensive ones across any vertical, given the amount of data and behavior and attributes that we actually track, uh, and which actually helps with the stickiness and going back to Sarah's point, trust, um, why people would want to continue to engage with the airline. Um, What we found out is that loyalty programs drive significant revenue, higher customer satisfaction, and loyalty to an airline at the best of times um, without a crisis. Uh, But during a downturn, it still results in less of a decrease than customers who aren't part of your customer uh, loyalty program. They remain invested in the brand, especially if it continues to add value um, to enrich the experience, uh, and they're still trying to engage, uh, even at the time when they're not able to actually buy uh, the product that you're able to sell, meaning air seats. So what we've seen is that they still want to engage with the brand, uh, whether they want to just find information about your schedule, about flights, about if they need to travel at this point, uh, not for leisure travel, but for essential travel, uh, they still see you as a one-stop shop. So they there is that expectation where they still need that f- constant feed of information. And mm-hmm. it's where personalization comes into play where as what Sarah mentioned, we continually ask people for surveys, um, conduct surveys generally, uh, either market specific or globally, uh, trying to find out what they want to find or hear about from us, given that they might not be traveling at this time, but they're also customers who are traveling at this time for essential reasons, uh, what is it they want to hear? So fine tuning your messaging uh, across uh, and helps with that as well and also helps to build trust and helps to continue the engagement that they have with your brand Um, if they feel you as a one-stop shop uh, where they can find exactly the information they need at the right time they will continue to engage with you and for those who need to travel at this time especially with covid they need to find out what covid safety measures you're you're put into place um, giving them the exact confidence the right products of course like we're one of the first few airlines that puts out uh, a very fully flexible product where if your plans change or the plans change for you, given the government regulations and whatnot, um, you're able to be flexible with your ticket. Uh, so all of that information helps uh, with customer loyalty and customer experience. And at the end of all of this, the customers will remember who's treated them well, uh, and they will continue to engage with you if you treat them well. Uh, so that also goes back to the stickiness of it all. One of the things that really, uh, I guess, what's the word, bugged me, probably offended me as a as a flyer, um, was how hard it was pre-pandemic. Was how hard it was to change travel plans, you know, and and how the charges and the the rigmarole and the red tape you had to go through to do something as simple as effectively even change a flight, let alone cancel one. And I I, I welcome the flexibility that. that I guess, you know, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is it's brought flexibility on all of us and we have to be different in the way, the way we treat our customers. Is that here to stay in the airline industry? That's here to stay because uh, also that's going to 
customer behavior and not just airlines as well to most products, whether it be hotel stays, um, tickets for concerts, for example, people now demand a certain level of flexibility. And of course, if there is a higher, either there's a higher charge or nominal charge, um, they would expect that as a normal customer behavior and now customer experience where they expect that now from any product that they buy. Um, of yeah. course, F F FMCG is different, but if it's an experience that has some degree of change or uncertainty, they'll be looking for that. So that's here to stay. So back to your point, yes, um, one of the silver linings out of all of this it, it has improved the whole customer experience. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, really interesting to see. I'm not one of your uh, frequent flyers. I'm, I apologize in advance, but um, BA and Virgin Atlantic are my two that I tended to flip between. Um, and I've got status with both of them and they've extended the status kind of ongoing regardless of what's been going on. And actually their comms through the pandemic has been pretty good. I was meant to be flying to Greece tomorrow for my birthday. Happy I birthday decided, in advance, Darren. Yeah, thank you. I decided not to go because this whole amber malarkey is just too much un uncertainty. But, you know, the ease of just cancelling my flight with BA and getting my voucher, it was done in, you know, a matter of five minutes. And it does make a huge difference now, knowing that I can spend that again, go back to BA, book another flight in the future. So, yeah, that flexibility has been welcomed i'd probably rather go back to the old days and not have a pandemic but as we now have a pandemic the flexibility is certainly welcome and also Thank another you. thing i'd like to add is technology has helped massively um, to develop that uh, customer experience and the need and necessity for it no thank you it's really interesting to hear thank you and we'll come back to you again mark i'm uh, coming to you now sir um we've effectively had five years of change in just 12 months and so high street retailers that were already facing uncertain futures pre-pandemic and now in all sorts of hot water, especially anyone that's not a grocery provider has is, is really struggled. How do retailers adapt and pivot their way back to that growth place where they probably have long forgotten what it feels like? Yeah, they're in a real, I mean, they're in a real state um, and there's a real challenge ahead of them. And if you think about where they were before pandemic, they were all grasping for the same um, golden eggs. And Richard and Sarah have, 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 have listed them, right? We're talking about personalization. We're talking about customer experience. But the way I'm seeing it is that personalization and customer experience, like the experience that Richard just took us through at, at his airline, it's all, it's a given now. It's, you don't get a choice. If you're not there, you're already not at first base. But I think what retailers on the high street have to do in order to figure out their future is think less about customer experience now because that's got to be a given, that's got to be heightened and more about customer orientation. So everything you provide can't be, um, can't be from a corporate point of view, can't be from a business point of view. It's got to be for the customer. It's got to be, we talk a lot, you hear from businesses all the time, we put customers at the heart of everything we do. I don't, I don't think that's true. I think if you put customers at the heart of everything you do, your entire service and product is built around providing the best for that customer rather than providing the outcomes for your shareholders, okay? And it's a different mindset. And here's what, here's what I mean. There's a, a US academic and, and, and big thinker and big writer in, uh, who came up with a, a long time ago, his name's Clayton Christensen. I'm sure many have heard of him. Mm. He came up with this very, very simple thing about jobs to be done. If you're gonna be a marketer, You've got to think about the jobs to be done by your brand or product. Now, what he's talking about is the whole um, buyers of a six millimeter drill bit do not want a six millimeter drill bit. They want a six millimeter hole. So the job to be done there is to provide them with the, the, the means to get a six millimeter hole. Retailers have got to figure out that long ago when stores and bricks and mortar were first invented, they, that, they were providing the job to be done. They, the, their reason to exist was the only way you could buy stuff was to go to the store. So you went to the store. Now that's not the way we buy stuff. We buy stuff online. So what are they for then? What are your bricks and mortar on the high street, your legacy, amazing property, your flagship store locations on, you know, we were on Oxford Street not long ago built, filming a video for our Life on the Digital High Street campaign, which is trying to answer a lot of these questions for high street retailers. On Oxford Street, they were, every single store on Oxford Street, I think there's about 200 of them, relied for so long on three or four million people coming past a week. They relied specifically on the, the equivalent of 4% of the UK population passing their doors every single week. 
even now with stores open, that's not happening. We were there, we've interviewed shoppers, we've interviewed analysts, we've interviewed stores and retailers, and there's, 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 there's all sorts of things that are coming to light. And as, as, as we've talked about before, the job to be done now is not selling stuff. We can do that elsewhere. The job to be done is something else. What are you there for? So do you provide experiences, exclusives? Um, are you there to help um, with the customer journey of trying on or fitting? There's a, there's a little company that's doing amazingly well and I think is just now raising a fund, um, raising finance called Sook, which is um, the Arabic name for market. And it's come up with this brilliant idea. It's saying M&S shouldn't be paying rent for a flagship store on Oxford Street or in Birmingham or Cardiff or Manchester or Liverpool um, for the whole week. It shouldn't because nighttime already eradicates, well, I'm paying for nighttime rent, but nobody's shopping at nighttime. But now nobody's shopping during the daytime either. What am I doing with this property? So what Sook has done has taken units on a number of high streets and invited brands big and small, and big brands are doing it as well, Barclays and and Vodafone, to have that store fronted, kitted, and, and fitted out with its stuff and a, a small number of SKUs for the hours per week that it thinks it can sell. And it might be four hours on a Saturday and two hours each of the other days. And Sook has got this sort of, um, they've got this kind of kit, which means they've got some stuff in the back. They can fit it from Vodafone to Barclays to some amazing digital online first brand that wants a physical presence for a couple of hours a week because it wants to show some exclusive new range within minutes. So it takes like 15 minutes to turn the shop around and you buy this thing by the hour. And so the high street's changing purpose yeah. um, and the retailers have got to follow. They've got to understand rather than what we can provide for the customers, what is it the customers now want to use us for? Because it ain't just buying stuff. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. And, and what Sook are doing are, is, is actually quite incredible and, and hopefully revolutionary long term as well. But um, Well, it's one new use case for the high street. Let's see what else there is out there. Absolutely. It's a great, it's a great example. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I will return to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Jocelyn, I'm going to come to you. You've been very patiently waiting there <laughs> to have a turn. So uh, thank you. Uh, brand advocacy, it's talked about a lot. Um, how do retailers nurture brand advocacy through the online customer journey? Yeah, I think we've, we've kind of touched on this and Mark just highlighted um, that today failing to provide that highly personalized experiences has consequences beyond that insufficient marketing spend. So with customer loyalty and market share on the line, it's really important to not only focus on those experience, but orchestrate meaningful relationships and, and doing this through intelligent insights. And as we all know, with the uh, impending death of third party um, cookies, that collecting that data is going to be even more difficult or those insights. And so there's really, from my perspective, two areas that we need to focus on to really help with that online customer journey. And the first is make sure that you're not too reliant on one or two marketing channels um, and ensure that your marketing mix is diverse with a clear focus on channels that can collect that first party data um, and you're not so reliant on the Googles or the Facebook. So you need to have that mix. And the second thing really is connecting your marketing tools. And I bang on about this a lot, but it is so important and makes such a big difference in that customer journey. So when data is siloed, you really you lose the power of that channel. So it's the cherry on top that truly enables retailers to turn that online uh, experience into a customer uh, first omni-channel experience that builds that advocacy. And from a referral perspective, a really good example of this is um, our client Pretty Little Things. So all they did is simply connect their referral data with their marketing automation tools. And straight away, straight away, they saw a huge impact on the number of high volume, um, the, the volume, sorry, of high value customers that were coming through from that. So it's simply making sure that not only are you focused on you know, the experience on site, but everything that you're doing with those data and insights in the background and making sure that they're all connected. Some great examples. And I, I, I think 
it's still not being done well in so many places right now. Would you agree? Very much so. And this is like, that's why I said at the beginning, I, I bang on about this a lot because it seems like a yeah. thing to say, but it's really a lot of brands are missing the trick there and it makes a huge impact. So what's, what's the blocker? What if, why don't some retailers get it? I think in some cases, it's the tech, if you have chosen a technology, let's say it's a point solution, without considering the integrations that they have with the rest of your tech stack, that can be a blocker. Is that data being passed and is it being passed easily? And then also having the right expertise within the companies that you're working with on uh, have, advising you on how to use that data. You know, how can that data help and provide those insights that isn't just surface level? So it's that expertise and the right tools that are integrated into your tech stack. Okay, got it. Thank you for that. Very compelling feedback. Our audience is staying with us. So uh, great job so far, panel. Uh, job <laughs> well done. Um, Sarah, I'm going to come back to you, um, if I may. How does a brand like yours uh, leverage the all important and growing trend of personalization for you know, extra loyalty and increased engagement? Um, yeah, so for us, we've had a loyalty program for a long time on our site. Um, but I think it's so there's so many loyalty programs out there that are all very generic, very simple, but kind of lose that, um, I don't know, a special touch. So what we've done with our loyalty program is making sure that it's really connected with our community. So for example, we've called it Astrid and You, and we've got a community, a new Instagram community channel called Astrid and You. So it kind of gets that customer engaged on a different level um, and it ties into everything that we do, a 360 marketing approach. So um, it kind of makes people really want to join that sort of cult um, and be a part of that loyalty program. And I think that is so important for it, that engage, customer engagement and making people feel more special and personalized. Um, so what we also do is really incentivize, incentivize customers to spread the word about um, the brand and all the brand ambassadors. So everyone wants to tell their friends and family and show off their new jewelry piece or show off their experience that they've had with the brand. Um, I completely agree with everyone's points about that emotional connection and that experience. And this is why retail is so important for us because we have a different type of experience in our stores than what other people have. We, we do um, piercing, tattoos, welding, and people have an amazing time when they come and they want to bring their family and friends and mm -hmm. always remember the time that they had a piercing with us. And I think that really helps increase engagement because people tweet about it, they, they post it on TikTok <laughs> um, and then they keep coming back. And again, like everyone said, um, I think it's so important to have that um, omni-channel approach and sort of say messaging and importance across all channels, not just say email, um, which is the typical one that people would use for personalization um, and just looking at every channel as a whole. Um, and yeah, just encouraging people to talk about the brand rather yeah. than you always telling them how amazing it is. <laughs> yeah, the, well, the service you're providing is, is generating content. You yeah. Know, it's, in that sense, it's, you know, it's almost vertically integrated. You're producing your own content, but through your customers. Yeah, definitely. And it makes our job easier. And it, it's, yeah. yeah, it's so nice because they're coming along the journey with us. And it's not just, yeah, us producing the content of our models. It's all real people and people get excited, want to, yeah, we've just done, um, launched on TikTok and everyone's doing their own TikTok videos of in the store. And it's just really exciting and engaging in that way. Um, and we found that it, it works really well for us. That's brilliant. Thank you for that example. Richard, what, sort of continuing that theme and, you know, future proofing and turning loyal customers into brand ambassadors. Can you share anything with us? 
Yes, of course. And it, this really ties into what Sarah just mentioned and also a bit what Jocelyn mentioned earlier is I think first things first, you have to really evaluate your organization's maturity model around uh, optimization and loyalty and make sure that you're using the right um, tools, analytics, and also the utilization of any learnings and any positive use cases, um, all the things that Sarah mentioned, of course, uh, which would allow your customers to be brand advocates through seamless method methodologies, for example. Um, just to mention, uh, like for what intended, mention me, I, I use a lot of brands that already use mention me, for example, like Pharmacin is one because um, I like ordering meat and then with the referral program that allows me to be a brand ambassador and that, and that of course but also like internally from our side uh, we have this product aimed at students called MH Explorer where automatically if you sign up you get up to 30% off on all flights all year round and you're able to share this benefit with friends and family as well uh, for a one-time use so that goes away, again across people being incentivized to share your product across friends and families as well. Um, and for example, um, to Sarah's point, uh, UGC, um, we don't have yet uh, our own organic TikTok accounts, but we're one of, we're I think 13th uh, in the UK, uh, largest mentions of Malaysia air, of an airline on TikTok with 21 million mentions. And this is just purely down to our cabin crew who have been super creative creating their own content, uh, simulating their own customer journey from getting ready for the day to going the flight, to going to the destination. And that has created significant engagement with customers and also allowing customers to do the same as well. So you're all around uh, making brand ambassadors without them realizing, but because they enjoy it. So they're, you're providing something that they enjoy to do. Uh, and to, again, to Sarah's point, it saves um, a ton of marketing budget and it's more authentic because uh, you're creating brand ambassadors to tell your message for you. Uh, so different products, but have the fundamentals in place that you're quickly able to capitalize on it. And you're not, you're seeing an opportunity where you have a big growth in mentions, for example, uh, and you're able to capitalize the, on it with putting the right products in place for people to engage with. Thank you, sir. And impressive TikTok stats there. Without having our own organic account, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes, we <laughs> exactly. Um, we do have a, a, a question come in from a TRB guest, an anonymous guest, and I will come back to that shortly. But I'm going to continue around this theme for now of loyalty, and then um, we'll come back to our our panelists. Uh, sorry, our, our guests' uh, question for the panelists. Um, Mark, there are a plethora of dedicated schemes out there, right? So customers. Customer loyalty schemes uh, compared to referral programs, it can be a bit bamboozling. Is one better than the other? And, and how can retailers take advantage of these schemes to turn their customers into advocates? Uh, I'm like Richard, uh, I, or at least like Malaysia Airlines, in that I don't have my organic TikTok account. I'm unlike Malaysia Airlines, and currently my mentions on TikTok are. A, around zero, so um, just <laughs> still to master that channel. Um, the answer to your question from my point of view is no, nothing's better. It's about what you're trying to do. And that sounds like a glib cliche, but, but, but let's delve into it a bit more. Uh, around 10 years ago, I was um, Marketing Week editor hosting a conference of CRM, heads of CRM from big brands, real, real data heads, okay? And um, these guys were, uh, there to take in a load of great content from the stage and in the tea break i was trying to mingle with some of my readers um, and i went over to a cluster of guys who were talking ferociously and really vociferously and as soon as i turned up they recognized me from the stage and they all went quiet i said what's going on guys what what, 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 what are we discussing and they said if you can keep it off the record we're all standing here discussing why our loyalty uh, schemes suck and these were some really big you know, high street retailers in the UK. So well-known brands. I said, well, tell me more. I mean, this is off the record. What, 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 why do your loyalty schemes suck? And one of them just simply said, because people don't come into our shop looking for points. Yeah. They don't. And so loyalty has evolved, obviously, in that. Loyalty has evolved in that, in that 10 years. Uh, some of the schemes I see out there are super sophisticated and really smart. And it, I don't see it any time being anything other than what it is, which is a hugely entrenched and uh, massively uh, valuable ingredient in anyone's marketing stack. 
But here's what I also think about loyalty. It's a closed shop. Unless you are prepared to take the, the sort of really smart strategies that Richard and Sarah have both um, uh, described in the last 10 minutes to turn loyalty scheme members into outwardly proud advocates, your, let's take a base example, albeit, you know, I'll admit it's a base example, but for the sake of simplicity, a coffee card, buy nine and you get your 10th coffee free, nobody else has to know. It's a private closed affair. It's, um, it's a very specific, there's a ceiling on it. It's only going to benefit you, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas referral is an outwardly proud moment where you, not, you don't just tell your friends about something that fits for them. You hear yourself saying it out loud. You post rationalize the fact that, well, this must be a this brand must be part of my makeup, my identity, because I've just heard myself saying so to my best mate or my friend or family. But another thing about um, loyalty is that it's, you know, it it's it's static in that you get your rewards for being loyal and doing the same thing. And I don't know if that's true loyalty. I think it's a loyalty to a loyalty scheme. I'll be loyal to your loyalty scheme unless the terms and conditions and rewards of your competitor's loyalty scheme are better. Keep giving me a freebie and yeah, I'll say I'm loyal. It's like throwing a dog a treat. For those of you with dogs, I don't have a dog, always wish I did. Um, I don't know if that's specifically loyalty. I think it's something else. I think, it, I think referral isn't baked into loyalty, but loyalty is definitely baked into referral. If you are a referrer who's multiple times referred somebody's brand, by definition, you are loyal, but the most the most stark difference to me, and again, unless you're talking about the way Malaysia Airlines have done it or, or, or the way Sarah's described it, the most stark difference is referral is a retention and engagement channel. It's a customer experience channel, but it's also a massively, it's a massive blind spot for those that don't use it. It's a massively growth acquisition-based channel. For every time you refer a brand, that person who has been referred to is five times more likely to go and find somebody else to refer to than other customers. Your base and, and the customer lifetime value of both the referrer and the referee are heightened. So you basically, while you're asleep, your best customers are turning into your best marketers and going to find your best customers. It's growth while you sleep. And the, the, way, the way I think about it is, I've seen some brilliantly, brilliantly smart loyalty programs just, just recently in going to find, in having come here to mention me, I've gone to find loyalty schemes that I love and that can, I, I, I admire, and are, they are out there. But so many loyalty schemes are still based around points, not people. And when, when it's that base, I reckon it's like yesterday's referral schemes. I think loyalty, I think the moment we, and, and what, ref, what, what, um, Jocelyn helps mention me do really well is partner up with loyalty and twin up with loyalty to make sure that just as she said, all of the uh, marketing channels are enhanced by our first party data. We can bring loyalty up to the fore by creating strong, powerful um, advocates. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in this place where I'm learning more and more about these, you know, I've, I've been aware of, and, and, uh, not an expert. I've been aware of the marketing landscape for a long time. But I'm seeing referral for the first time, really. I, I never wrote about it as Marketing Week editor. I'm now there where I'm kind of Kool-Aid drinker in Mention Me, total convert. And I see it as a very much a marketing channel that's being missed as opposed to an add-on valuable tool. It's really insightful. Thanks, Mark. Um, and I wonder why it's being missed, but maybe we can explore that a bit more as we continue the session. Um, Jocelyn, coming to you, um, the rise in DTC brands over the last 18 months, obviously a lot of that is due to the pandemic, but are there other reasons that that could be happening as well? And, and what can retailers learn from some of these new emerging businesses? Yeah, um, I actually could talk about this for days, so I'll try and keep it concise, but we have seen a direct-to-consumer market growing rapidly within double-digit rates for several years now. But as you said, the, the pandemic has accelerated that growth. And one of the reasons for this is really we're seeing that need to trust a brand grow. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a huge amount of customer, or brands sorry, experience the fir new first time buyers. And so acquisition numbers were going through the roof for health and beauty brands and uh, food and beverage or DIY and garden. 
so they were saying, seeing this growth, but then the challenge that they were having is getting that su subsequent order, that second, third, and why aren't they coming back? And so I, I think this has really highlighted that trust that's been needed, but also that need that going direct to brand means that these brands have control over that and they're able to um, hold on to that customer and nurture them in the right way. So we've also seen <clears throat> that this has meant that customers' expectations of a brand are at an all-time high. So it's something like over 50% of uh, consumers expect to receive a personalized discount within 24 hours of having first contact with a brand. So we really need to understand like, what our customers are looking for here and what their expect expectations are. We're also seeing customers want to engage directly with brands on different channels. So the massive rise in social selling and Facebook shop integrating with Shopify, live streaming e-commerce already exceeding over 6 billion in total transactions on apps. So this is all presenting a huge opportunity for brands to go direct and engage with customers at different levels of their, their buying cycle or their journey with the brand. And so I guess the most interesting thing is looking at this from a perspective of brands that have done this well and what does that mean? Like, what do we do with this information? And I think the, one of the biggest things is making that experience going direct to a brand different to what it is to go to another source where they can, they can find your, your products or services. And um, I think a good example of this is aviation, the gin that Ryan Reynolds runs. So if you were to buy that from anywhere else, you just buy the gin, you might know that he owns it, you just like the gin, you go to his site and there's hilarious videos of him talking about the gin. You can learn about how it's made, you have an experience on site, and then I'm talking about my experience and recommending my friends to go to the site and check these things out. And so that's really a differentiation. The making sure that that is different, that your experience is different. Another thing is really um, exploiting all marketing possibilities. And this kind of ties back to what I was saying before of having that diverse marketing mix. So we're seeing that rise in social shopping. And so making sure that you're making those quick shifts and not too stuck on what channel and making sure that you're, you're having that diverse mix. And then of course, always coming back to this, creating that custom Martech stack um, to make sure that you, for your brand, you have the right things to nurture the, that customer journey. And so we're seeing brands that are growing their D2C model, improving their profit margins, able to control their data and really create those customizable experiences and journeys with their, with their customers. So I think this is one of the reasons, or many of the reasons, why we're seeing such a shift here with a lot of brands. Thank you. And I see that wasn't days. That was a very full and compelling answer, but delivered in a matter of minutes. So thank you so much for that. Right, panel, are you ready for the question? And this is a finger, fin uh, fastest finger first moment. So um, I'm going to throw it out there and I'm going to read it verbatim. So it's from a TRB guest. Thank you, whoever you are. Could someone explain how hyper-personalization would take over personalization. Thank you. Who wants to take that one? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Fastest finger first does not include absolutely not. Uh, anyone understand that one? Hyper-personalization hyper would take over personalization. Thank you, they say. So I'll, 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 because nobody's put their finger up, I'll dive in. But I haven't got a clue. But there all you go. all I'm going to say is, whoever asked that question, I'm about to massively disappoint you. Um, the, the feeling, the, the, I don't know what hyper personalization is, or at least what you mean by it, as, as, a, as, a, as the person that asked the question. What I do know is that, as everybody has said on this panel so far, you don't get a choice anymore. You have to have a personalized experience. As an old person, I'm shocked to hear. Jocelyn's stat that 50% of customers expect a personalized discount on first visit. Like it stands to reason in all kinds of commerce that you get your discount for being loyal and you get your discount for doing the right thing as a customer by sharing and spreading. But no, people want a personalized, they expect to turn into your uh, customer today and have a, a discount just for being there 
by tomorrow. So suddenly you've got to figure out what personalized discount uh, means to them. And you've got to go, it can't just be the one size fits all, catch all, mass market sale promotion that we agreed as a business six months ago um, for the entire range and nothing else, just that range. It's got to be personalized. That's what Joss's stat was. It was about personalized discounts, unless I misheard you, Joss. Um, and, and, and here's where you go with that. There isn't time to figure out more than a few rules and processes and workflows and a framework for and, and, a, and a decision grid for how that's going to work. Because if you're going to do personalization, and I assume hyper-personalization just means lots more personalization, you can't treat the notion of giving somebody a personalized sales discount as solely a business decision that we're only going to do this. It's got to be based around that person who we don't yet know properly. And so I think all of this stuff, the drive for greater customer experience, the drive to join up your data points more effectively so that you can see the entire grid, the drive for greater personalization has to come from one single thing, and that's braver marketers taking quicker, uh, more autonomous decisions and begging forgiveness for them later if they go wrong. I think if you are a Boots or Sainsbury's level um, size organization and you're waiting, you've got a brilliant idea to answer a customer need and you're going to wait six weeks for it just to go up the chain and be looked at, you're done. So I think it takes, and, and we, again, agility is one of those things that we must hear on webinars and conferences so much that it just flies over the head. But I think it means single individual people, innovative, entrepreneurial, not necessarily retailers, so much as really sharp customer focused marketers taking decisions uh, and driving them forward and seeing if there's any evidence to show that they should be repeated and scaled out. So I Thank you. Thanks for being the one to jump in. Sorry, who was that? Sorry. It was me. I'm just going to echo that a little bit. And I think maybe what they're asking here is around hyper personalization. And as you've talked to Mark, like the AI around personalization, right? And um, uh, it is extremely important to be able to act quickly. And um, we've talked to you already today how it's getting harder and harder to collect that first party data. But what we do know is that actually over 65% of customers are willing to share their data with a brand if it means that their experience is going to be better. So even though it's harder to collect the data, people are very willing to share it because they want brands to make those hyper-personalized choices quickly and not wait. So I think that's um, just echoing what Rob, or sorry, Rob, Mark was saying. Not my 3%, you're out, you're out. <laughs> I have, I've just, I've just Googled hyper-personalization actually because I've not actually heard the term before. And so the official definition is hyper-personalization leverages AI and real-time data to deliver more relevant content, product, and service information to each user. This approach takes personalized marketing a step further. So there you go. Apparently, this is going to be a word we're hearing more of. Who knows? But it's all around AI and one-to-one -one marketing. So you're treating one person, not an entire segment or group or a very small segment. So that's what it means. It's done by technology. But I think the on back to the original question where hyper-personalization personalization versus personalization, I think it's a scale, it's not an either or. So it depends on the product that you're trying to push. Uh, that might be relevant for a number of people, that might be relevant for only one person. But not everybody has the technology uh, to able to deliver that at scale. And also, you're experiencing a little bit already on Instagram, for example, when you mention it's captured in WhatsApp, then you're getting immediately ads from that word mentioned on your Instagram account. So that's part of it already, but that's still a question whether people welcome that level of direct feed almost like buy this now, even before you know you want to buy it. It does beg the question, Richard, why you let me speak up and didn't just jump in before. <laughs> it's like I wanted to hear what you want to say as well. <laughs> no, thanks mate. <laughs> but I, I agree with everything Richard just said. Listen, if that question had come up and I'd been on a panel, I would have been like turning my screen off probably and just waiting for someone else to answer it or pretending that the dog needed me or something. So yeah, don't worry about it. I think that was all really great con uh, content in response to that. 
Um, we are whizzing through time and we've got like five, 10 minutes left. So um, I'm going to come to each of you for a, uh, a final question, if that's OK, before we wrap. So, Sarah, I'm going to come back to you, if I may put you on the spot uh, to close things off yeah. for your session today. Um, look, you guys are doing a brilliant job with advocacy, you know, and, and really connecting up your brand and your channels around telling that story. If, if a retailer was watching this today, what would be the number one piece of advice you guys would give them in terms of really trying to improve or build their advocacy? Um, I think one of the main things is, is to be really strong with your views as a brand. So we did a lot of work internally and everyone that works for the brand really knows exactly what we stand for, what our values are, what our views are, and everyone really trusts in that. And then I think to then be very strong in what in the conversations that you're joining to your customers on all your platforms so it just seems really authentic I think that's so important you you can't make things up you can't just join movements because you feel the need you have to like customers are so smart and savvy now they'll see straight through that so you just need to be really strong in what what your values are and what you stand for and obviously you aren't going to agree with everything that goes on in the current climate or environment so so don't talk about them just just stand to what you know and what you believe in um and then yeah you might it might be controversial but the people that really care will will join you in that um conversation and i think that's really important and that's how we've been able to build this community around our brand and really talk to our customers in a really honest and transparent way. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you guys do a cracking job and it's been great to have you on the, the panel today. Welcome Thanks. to the world that wasn't maternity for an hour. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks um, for having me. <laughs> and uh, it's been really great to work with you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Richard, coming uh, back to you, sir. Um, in terms of, you know, we spoke a lot with, with Mark before about referral versus loyalty and so on. How valuable are all of those offers and rewards and schemes in your industry and in your airline particularly? Very valuable. Let's put it in today's context, given that there's a big push for airlines to diversify their product offerings and their robust loyalty programs, given that they're unable to use their points and miles on actually buying an air ticket because of the whole global restrictions on travel so customers still want to engage with the brand they still feel like they're a part of it that their loyalty is rewarded so there has to be a way where they're able to use earn and still use their miles and points on different products so what that means is you have to still diversify your offering and partner with different brands organizations where they're able to use those and that gives um, them a level of importance as well going back to being advocates um, of the loyalty program and also because they're able to use it. So it doesn't mean that because they're not able to buy an air ticket at this point for leisure travel, um, that means they can't engage with your brand, not at all. So you have to find a way why they're able to still engage with your loyalty program and you have to reward them for doing so. And there has to be a utilization for them to do so. Uh, so they're able to still do, um, still feel like they're a part of the brand as well, which for them is very important. So 100% it is valuable. And we're still doing a lot of work on that one. And thank you, sir. And thank you for being our first airline panelist. I think it's in TRB history. So much appreciated. And, you know, genuinely as a avid flyer, I wish you guys and the industry a, a positive way back ASAP as well. So, uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you, Danny. Yeah, absolutely. And I promise to fly Malaysian one day as well. Because um, I've heard good things, actually. I just never have. So I will. I make that promise to you. Um, Mark. Coming back to you, sir. So you've mentioned what Suka are doing, and that's, you know, it's a great example. Is there anyone else that you would call out as, you know, ones that we should be watching in the in the kind of loyalty space? Yeah, I, I definitely think you should go to the, the Mention Me Clients page and check out people that know. Um, look, I, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I actually think that, um, I actually think who's doing well and who's not doing well is is a question we could, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very subjective thing and I don't necessarily need to have like an, uh, project what, I, what anyone feels as an expert view. I do think that it's about 
those that feel, and sorry to be a bit cliched here, but those that feel human and organic and authentic and natural and real for you, and, and that your customers feel like you're not making too much of an effort or you're not invading them at the wrong time. And that stuff's really, really hard to get right, really hard to get right. Like, we don't think, of, because we're marketers, we don't think of our brands like customers do. We think everybody's interested in our brands all the time. I mean, there was a tweet <laughs> for last week. There was, um, it was pretty stark. It was a big, it was a screen at a conference that was about as big as four London buses. It was massive. And you only know that because the, the presenter was so tiny in front of it that you couldn't see who it was. And the, and the, the, the screen said something like, the, the, the slide said something like, turn customers into fanatics, turn products into obsessions, turn employees into ambassadors and turn brands into religions. And the tweet, whoever had sort of tweeted the picture, just put at the top, listen, dude, I'm just trying to buy a toothbrush. <laughs> and, you, and, you kind, and you kind of go, we've got to be careful. We don't yeah. all have to be an obsession product or a religion brand. But as Sarah said about her, her products, it's those, that, that, those, there's a cult, there's a, a community that loves talking and loves sharing. And so without sort of resorting to who's doing well and who's not, it's, for me, it's more like, how much of a customer do you feel you can be as a marketer? That's when you're getting it right. How, do you, how can you objectively switch off all the biases that you're required to walk around with in your head and your heart when you're walking around the building or dealing with any kind of work meeting. How can you switch those off? How often can you switch those off and try and look at your entire experience from the website to the copy, to the ad you might see, to the um, experience of post-purchase like a, like a customer? Uh, how much do you listen to customers when you think your world is absolutely smacking it and you hear somebody saying that was a you know, that, that, that wasn't so good at all. You know, what, what are you doing about that? So when it comes to loyalty, when it comes to referral, when it comes to any kind of advocacy, you've got to make sure that you're not walking into a room, banging a drum and wearing a medal while everybody else is trying to avoid eye contact. And yeah. it's about making sure that you're listening. And for me, the brands that are doing it well are doing just that. They're feeling like they're customers. Yeah. Um, yeah. They know their audience, basically. They understand their audience. Yeah. Mark, thank you. Uh, brilliant contributions. And uh, I'm going to move on to your colleague to close things off. Jocelyn, give us some closing words. I mean, what's, what's your thoughts on, on what Mark was saying? Give us some closing words. Um, so my closing words are not going to be surprising, right? Focus on diversifying your marketing channels. This is really, really key. And I, I want to emphasize that point and make sure you're true to your brand. Being authentic and having the right messages is always going to be more effective than trying to be something that you're not. And so really sticking to that and communicating and knowing who your audience is, communicating on the right channels and not being too complacent with single channels is key. And finally, make sure they're all talking to each other and your tech stack is integrated with one another. Thank you so much, Justin. And again, thank you, uh, Justin and Mark, for um, mentioning me sponsorship today. That's it, guys. I mean, this authenticity piece has really come out as a theme of this panel around loyalty as well. And I do think customers, uh, they're not they are not a, a stupid bunch of people that we just need to treat uh, with no regard. They can see things for what they are and they can see whether something's authentic or not. And I think that's been a real theme of the panel. You've been a, an amazing bunch of people to work with today. Thank you so much. Our audience stayed with us. They didn't ask any questions. And that seems to be a theme of all of the webinars today. We have a quiet day today with the audience, but at least they're not leaving us, which is great. If you are in the audience and you wish you'd asked a question, um, you can go to Karen H at the retail bulletin got Dot com karen h at retailbulletin.com and she will be able to forward a question on to you any of our panelists and i'm sure panelists would welcome uh, any approaches on linkedin as well that's it we take a very short break now before going on to our next webinar uh webinar number three is how a customer first mindset drives long-term retail uh, success but that's at 2 30 so um Come back and see us then. All that's left for me to say now is a massive thank you to Sarah, Mark, Justin and Rick.
Richard, for your contributions today. And I wish you all a lovely rest of your Thursday. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.